Good evening, this is Pamela, and you are listening to Watchmen on the Pod. We are going to continue in 1 John chapter 5. We're going to be starting with verse 4. Let's not forget that we are going through the Bible commentary series by J. Vernon McGee. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. Since we hear so much about victory in the Christian life today, it may seem strange to you that it occurs so rarely in the New Testament. What is it that overcomes the world? It is our faith. It is faith that saves us. It is faith that keeps us. We are saved by faith. We walk by faith. We are born children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And faith is the only way in which you and I will be able to overcome this world around us. Now, we have an enemy, and John has talked about this enemy before. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15. There is in the world that which is of the flesh, that which is of the world, that which is of the devil. As Wordsworth put it, the world is too much with us. As believers, we are in the world, but we are not to be of it. This world that you and I are in is a big, mean, bad world. We can be caught up in it very easily. We can be trapped by it. There is an illustration of this in the Old Testament, which I think might be helpful to us at this point. It is the story of Joshua and the children of Israel entering the promised land. First, I must say that the promised land is not a figure of heaven. Our songs which talk about Canaan being heaven and the place to which believers are going simply do not fit what God teaches us in the word. Actually, Canaan represents a condition in which believers ought to be living down here. We can live out in the wilderness And there are great many wildernesses believers live in today. They do not have any fun at all, although they think they do at times. There's no fun out in the wilderness. The wilderness march was not easy, but the land of Canaan is where we are blessed with all spiritual blessings. When Joshua entered the land, it was not handed to him on a silver platter. If you and I are to enjoy the spiritual blessings, which are ours, we need to recognize that we have a battle to fight. The enemy holds the territory, and he is not going to let us have any kind of deliverance or victory without a battle. When Joshua entered the promised land, therefore, there were three enemies that stood before him. Until he overcame them, he was not able to take the land. The first enemy was Jericho. And Jericho represents the world. That was the first place Joshua struck. It was obvious that he was trying to do. What he was trying to do was to split the land into two divisions and then take one at a time. The second enemy was little Ai, which represents the flesh. Joshua sent a small contingent up there, thinking it would be easy to take. But that is the one place where he received a telling defeat. Many Christians overcome the world, but they are always overcome by the flesh. In other words, there are many saints who don't engage in worldly practices, but they go to church and gossip. They indulge the flesh. They can blow the trumpet around Jericho, but they don't blow the trumpet around Ai. Then finally, there are where... Then finally... There were the Gibeonites, who represents the devil. They deceived Joshua. The devil was a liar from the beginning. He still deceives and works wily. Let's come back to verse 4 and look at it in reference to Jericho. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. If you are a child of God, you are going to overcome the world. How will you gain the victory? And this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. It is not by fighting, but by faith. How did this man Joshua overcome Jericho? Jericho was the enemy which was out in front of him, and he had to take the city. 
How was he going to take the city? By fighting it? He did not fight it at all, but God told him what to do. God said, I don't want you to use a battering ram to try to get through the gate. The thing which I want you to do is to march around the city. Instead of putting only your elite army in the front, the Marines or the special guards, I want you to also put the priests up there with the Ark of the Covenant. And the priests shall carry horns and trumpets are to be blown as they go around the city. But you are not to make an attack upon the city. It was a most unusual method which God gave to Joshua. I am confident that the city of Jericho had braced itself for the onslaught of those people who had crossed the Jordan River at flood stage, which must have seemed to Jericho to be an impossibility and a foreboding of things to come. So they shut up their city, ready to defend themselves against Israel. I think that their guard up on the gate gave the signal, Here they come, the whole army of Israel. As Israel marched up to the gate, you must remember that there was an army on the inside ready and waiting for them. But when the children of Israel came up to the gate, they made a right face and kept on marching. They marched once around the walls of the city and then went back to camp. You can be sure that there was a meeting of the general staff in the city of Jericho that night to try to figure out the strategy that Israel was using against them. As best they could, they prepared themselves for the next day when the guard on the gate again yelled down and said, Here they come. They braced themselves for the battle in case Israel tried to break, break through the gate. Probably there were soldiers up on top to pour boiling oil or water down upon them and to shoot arrows. But Israel didn't attempt to come through. They simply marched around the city again, and they repeated that for six days. By that time, the army staff inside the city of Jericho had just about gone crazy. They didn't know what in the world was taking place. On the seventh day, when Israel had gone around one time, the general staff heaved a sigh of relief and said, It sure looks like they're not going to take that city. They are just doing something very crazy. From the world's point of view, it was very crazy. You must admit that this was an unusual strategy. But this time the guard said, Wait a minute. They're not returning to camp. They are marching around again. And Israel proceeded to march around the city seven times. Then what happened? The priests of Israel blew the trumpets, the people shouted, and the walls of Jericho fell down. The children of Israel probably completed, completely encircled the city, and when the walls of Jericho fell down, the army on the inside was certainly taken by surprise. How did the children of Israel take the city of Jericho? By fighting? They did not fight at all. They were marching around according to the order given, not by Joshua, but by that unseen captain of the host of the Lord. Frankly, I used to have a problem with this incident in Scripture. My problem was not with the walls of Jericho falling down. That fact has been pretty well established by archaeological excavations. But the thing that disturbed me was why a man of Joshua's proven ability as a military leader would use such tactics like this. It is true that God commanded it, but I still think Joshua might have disagreed with the tactics. The answer lies in that earlier incident when Joshua saw the man with the drawn sword standing in the edge of the Israelite camp. See Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. Joshua went out and said to the man, If you want it in good old Americana, what's the big idea? Who told you to draw a sword? Joshua's question was, Art thou for us? Or for our adversary, Joshua five thirteen, That's the way our translation gives it, and it is a good translation. But probably Joshua really meant, what's the big idea? Who gave you an order to draw a sword? Joshua thought he was in charge, but when the man turned and answered, Joshua realized that he was a supernatural person. I personally believe that he was none other than the pre-incarnate Christ Then Joshua fell at his feet and worshipped him. So you see, before the battle of Jericho, this man, Joshua, learned that he was not really in charge. General headquarters was not in his tent, but in heaven with the captain of hosts. 
of the Lord, for that is how the stranger identified himself. Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? Joshua chapter 5 verse 14. In other words, the Lord was telling Joshua, this battle you are fighting is a spiritual battle as well as a physical one, and I am the captain. So General Joshua was not going to take his orders from the captain of the host of the Lord. And the captain said, march around the city. With this incident in mind, I don't have any trouble understanding Joshua. If you had met him and asked him why in the world he was using such a crazy maneuver, I think he would have agreed with you, say, this is crazy, isn't it? But after all, I'm just taking orders. If you have ever had any army experience, you know that a buck private never talks back to a captain. That is, when the captain says, go, do this, the private doesn't stop and say, I've been thinking this over myself, and I think there's a better way of doing it. Did you ever hear of a buck private saying that to a captain? No. He says, yes, sir, I'll go do it. And he goes and does whatever the captain has commanded. When I was in the National Guard, some fellows got into trouble by slipping out during the night. The next day, the captain gave them an order to dig a hole. He said, I want this hole six feet long, and I want it three feet wide, and I want it five feet deep. The fellows dug the hole and then went in and reported to the captain. The captain came out, looked at the hole, and he said, Now I want you to fill it back up with dirt. They had to fill it back up with dirt. That sounds sort of crazy, but they had to obey orders. Joshua was, was obeying orders. He was being obedient. He believed the captain. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. It wasn't by fighting or military skills, but by faith that the walls of Jericho fell down. What is the lesson for us today? You and I cannot overcome the world by fighting it. This is one reason that as a pastor, I never engaged in any reform movement, no matter how worthwhile it was. And I agree that many of them were good. I would never serve on the committee, nor would I have part in it as a pastor of a church, because I do not think I was called to get into that at all. You don't overcome the world by fighting it. I knew a former movie star many years ago who called me when I was a pastor in downtown Los Angeles and asked if I would serve on a committee to help reform downtown Los Angeles. Downtown Los Angeles <clears throat> needed reforming then, and it still does, but I never felt I was called to do that. I refused to serve on the committee, and she couldn't believe it. She says, do you mean to tell me that you won't serve on the committee? As a preacher, you are not interested in that? I said, I didn't say that. I just won't serve on the committee. And I told her why. I said, the Lord called me to fish in the fish pond, but he never told me to clean up the fish pond. So my business is fishing, giving out the word of God. I let the spirit of God do any cleaning up that needs to be done. That is the department he is in, and I'm not in that department. She didn't like it. But she had to accept it, of course. I don't fight the world today. I'm not in any great reformation movement. I'm not trying to straighten up our government, although I think it needs straightening up. I think that both the Democratic and the Republican parties are in shambles today. We are without leadership as a nation. Although I recognize all of this, it is not my business to try to change it. My business is to give out the word of God. Although he had the army, Joshua's business was not to fight. His business was to believe God. He believed God, and the walls fell down. <clears throat> My friend, today we are saved by faith, and if we are going to overcome this world, we'll not overcome it by fighting it. We're going to overcome it by faith. That is the only way you and I can deal with this world in which we live, and that is the great message which is here for us. Praise God. Wow. All right. First John chapter five, verse five. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God. 
when you really trust Christ, it is not a question of your own power, but you are kept by the power of God through faith. We have faith in Christ for salvation in the future and faith in Christ for salvation from the world here and now. Praise God. And I'm going to end it there. That is a lot to think on because even though Dr. McGee died in 1988, boy, would he ever be blown away by what's happening in the world today. We still are in need of a great government because we definitely do not have one. They're all crooked and uh, perverse, and it's just horrible. But you know what? God knew it. God foretold it. And we need to just praise God and rejoice because soon and very soon we will see the king. Praise God. I can't wait for that day. I'll tell you that right now. Well, I'm going to close it there for now. I love you all so very, very much. And as always, keep your eyes on Jesus your nose in the book, which is the Word of God. And embed the Word of God upon the tablets of your hearts so you will not sin against God. You have a blessed evening. Bye-bye.